Hello, everyone. Welcome to this keynote session. The keynote topic is Bring the Next Generation of AI Assistant, presented by Yan Ning. Yan Ning is experienced in conversational AI engineering management and the Python best practices. And in this talk, Yan Ning will also show us how to build an AI assistant. So what are we waiting for? Please join me in welcoming Yan Ning. Hi. I'm Yanni Chang, and today I'm really happy to be here at PyCon Taiwan as one of the keynote speakers. Today we'll be speaking about building next level AI assistants, so let us begin. A bit about myself uh, I'm Yanni Chang, and pronouns she, her. I'm an engineering manager at Raza. So at Raza, we work on the standard open source infrastructure for building conversational AI. I'm originally from Hong Kong, and now, not, and now I live in the beautiful city of Hamburg, Germany. So Raza office is actually in Berlin, uh, and also we have uh, members distributed across the UK, US, and I'm working remotely. Uh, I'm a board member of the Python Software Fair Band, where we organized PyCon DE. So if you want to come, I think next year we're actually doing things in person. I'm also a co-organizer of Python Pizza, which is a, uh, a conference that's distributed across Hamburg, Berlin, and it's a very fun event. Um, in my free time, I also like to contribute to Lead Dev, a platform where a lot of engineering managers and leaders gather. And I talk about topics like engineering leadership and also a topic that is close to my heart, diversity and inclusion. Great, let's talk about today's agenda. We'll open with the world of conversational AI and see where are the useful use cases of conversational AI across different sectors. We can explore what are the main usages of conversational AI and where are we at. And then we're gonna move on to the five levels of conversational AI. What is our status quo? What is the limit of conversational AI? We'll be using a framework to analyze what it means to um, advance from one level to another. And then we're going to move on to a crash course on NLP natural language processing and also some of the conversational AI concepts so that we can familiarize ourselves with this uh, topic that will prepare us for the last topic which is getting our hands dirty and building an assistant together. And we'll be using Raza for that since that's what I'm most familiar with. And we'll be building a newsletter subscription bot. Without further ado, let's dive right in. We'll begin with the world of conversational AI as an introduction. I think for a lot of us, AI assistants are really the new faces of tech, right? If you look at the <laughs> devices on the screen, we can now control our lights, we can play music, we can reply to our text messages even using smart home devices or your smartphone. They're really everywhere. And it's not just for the consumer space, in the B2B space, uh, conversational AI is also used to automate repetitive tasks and workflows. For example, there is an extensive usage of AI assistance in technical support, right? Some of these tasks, they are more gruesome for humans to do over and over again. For example, troubleshooting internet, cable, or phone connections, that's one. Or setting up a new device, requesting replacement device, installing software. These are the things that we call it like the FAQ category that the bot can handle and can support our customers or maybe internal users, right? And then customer experience is a big one. This is another prominent use case for conversational AI. For example, helping out with account and billing, uh, post-sales support. Um, these support flows are oftentimes paired with something called a human handoff step. So for example, if the bot is not yet configured for a certain use case, or if it doesn't have enough confidence to solve a customer's need, or maybe didn't quite understand what the customer needs or uh, what they want, what they're thinking, then the bot can actually pass the conversation back to a customer service specialist to solve the customer's need. So as we advance in conversational AI, I think it opens up 
uh, technology further to serve the people who were once left behind. I think as the technology matures, it will open up opportunities for people who once they're not equipped to navigate a web interface, right? Conversational AI can become the new interface of the internet. And I think for a lot of categories, it is already happening. So haven't dived into some of these sectors that use conversational AI. Let's find a framework to represent uh, where the technology is at and where we can advance further. So we'll use this five levels of conversational AI to talk about the evolution. For AI assistance to work for everyone, uh, we need it to work for both the end user and developer experiences, right? Uh, but today, uh, for uh, the timing's sake, because we don't have too much time together, we'll talk more about the end user experience because we, um, yeah, because that's uh, that will be our focus today. So as we focus, uh, as we progress through the five levels, assistance become more accommodating to the way people think, and it feels less like an API endpoint, for example, that you need to know exactly how to use it, right? Uh, hopefully it can accommodate more human languages and uh, natural languages. So we can take a look at an example of a person, say if they want to get a quote for getting a mortgage. At each level, we're gonna go through an example on how we're lowering the burden on the person getting the mortgage on the end user so that it's easier to translate what they want, which is likely a new place to live into the language of, of the bank. And they're probably thinking, okay, this person getting a quote for a 30 year fixed rate mortgage, yada, yada. So how would level one assistance look like for people who want to get a mortgage? A level one assistance just put all the work on the end users who are using the bot, right? Static web forms can be one example. You know, you type through the different fields, but you need to put in the exact information they want. Uh, command line applications is another example, as you see on the screen. So command line apps are great for experts, probably some of the audience that we see here. Maybe you prefer this way of communicating with a machine, but it has a steep learning curve and that's undeniable. The command for generating a mortgage quote may look like what you see on the screen, and that requires the end user to know exactly the input fields to put in there, right? You need to know what the flag means. Uh, it's tricky, but I guess it's still more convenient that if we do it on uh, paper by hand. <laughs> now, level two assistants, they are basic chatbots. So if a user says something similar to, uh, I'm interested in mortgage rates, the chatbot will ask them a couple of questions, right? And gathering the same information that we previously provide with the command line, but it's slightly more interactive. It looks like you're messaging someone. But there's something very frustrating about these level two assistants is that they crash hard when you deviate from the so-called happy path. So the user can say uh, you know, what they want. For example, I want a mortgage and then they give the information, for example, fixed rate, please, in natural language. But they have to uh, behave exactly as the assistant expects, right? And following the happy path, uh, they have to provide the information that the bot asks for and not say anything else random. Uh, they wouldn't maybe even uh, handle like a slight detour, which we're gonna go through uh, more in depth in later parts of the talk. But these are the most common types of assistance in the market out there. So um, let's talk about level three, and those are contextual assistants. If you think about how humans talk to each other, you'll probably agree that the context really matters, whether well, you sort of have to remember what people said uh, in the beginning, uh, what they said when, where, how the tone is like, uh, and that should influence how the conversation should go. The user can ask for some clarification as well from the bot, for example, like how does the monthly payment compare to renting? How long do people usually take to pay that off? They can also correct themselves or change their mind. And that is actually harder than it seems. And typos happen everywhere, but that's actually a bit difficult for the assistants to deal with uh, without maybe derailing the conversation because the assistants, all they want is like these few input 
uh, uh, the, to fill up the few input fields that you have there, right? Um, but still, the user needs to know exactly what they want, right? For example, I want a mortgage quote. However, they don't have to know how to use the assistant. They don't have to look up a manual or something to avoid breaking the conversation. And these contextual AI assistants, it is a big step further from level two uh, assistants. It's also like much harder to develop on an infrastructure standpoint. And the best thing is you can already build them using some infrastructure, like pre-existing infrastructure, for example, Raza, which is open source. Now, let's move on to level four. These are consultative assistants. So the user can express their situation in their own terms. For example, like in the conversation here, you can say my kids have gone to college and I want to downsize. And a mortgage offer may be the end result, but the user doesn't have to know that, right? And as a developer, it's tempting to think that this is ambiguous input because the intent isn't really clear from the sentence itself. But for a human, um, I think what the person said is perfectly clear. So I don't think it's a very helpful mindset to regard this as an ambiguous input. And it's the assistant's job to figure out how they can help. Now, next up, we have level five, which are adaptive assistants. So the assistant can really get the level of detail that the user is looking for. Maybe the user just wants to know what is the typical fixed interest rates uh, and that's around like 3 to 3.5% 3 uh, right now. Or maybe they want to calculate a very detailed offer. Or maybe they have already done a lot of research and just need some little extra clarification. And the level five assistants would be able to pick up these cues and adjust its behavior. And at each of these level, we're lowering the burden on the end user to translate what they want into the language of the bank. And that's exactly where the value of conversational AI is. Great. Now on to a very exciting part, which is the crash course on conversational AI. And we're going to do a deep dive here. How can we enable developers to go beyond basic chatbots like what we've discussed in level one and two? The answer is with the machine learning based approach so you can learn from conversational data. To understand this better, um, let's go through an overview on how a conversational AI infrastructure framework can look like. Um, here I'm picking Raza <laughs> because that's what I'm most familiar with, but um, a lot of the solutions in the market, they follow like a similar structure and has the same a similar uh, terminology. So it's also like generic knowledge that we're talking about here. We'll first begin with talking about the infrastructure. Um, so yeah, Raza has a conversational AI infrastructure product called Raza Open Source. It contains two main components. Uh, one is the natural language understanding part, uh, short form for NLU. And then the second part is called dialogue management. So it's a machine learning framework for you to automate text and voice-based assistance. And let's dive deeper into what each of these component means so that uh, by the end of this session, everybody can at least take away something that's less abstract and then you'll have uh, renewed understanding, hopefully, uh, on conversational AI. Uh, natural language understanding, um, that's so-called the ear of your assistant. It helps your assistant to understand what is being said by a human. So it takes some user input uh, in what we call like unstructured human language, and then we can extract structured data out of it so that the machine can understand us. Usually it's done in the interface like or a form called intents and entities. So what are intents and entities? For the folks who are not as familiar, we're going to go through that in a bit. Intents, they can be understood as like labels that represent the over go overall goal for the user's input. For example, a message called hello, uh, that will have the label greet because the meaning of this message is greeting. When I say hello, I want to greet you. So that will be the intent of this message. 
And now let's go to entities. So here I take the example of like, hello, my name is Yeni. Entities are pieces of information that an assistant might need in a certain context. Like in this uh, message, right? Uh, my name is Yeni that has my name in it. And the assistant should, be, uh, should extract that name and then they should remember it throughout the conversation, right? So that later on they can like throw the name out so that the interaction is more natural, more like a human. And this is achieved by training a named entity recognition model so that you can identify and extract some of these entities. And in this example, it will be names for uh, unstructured user messages. Yeah, so <laughs> these two are the most important things. <laughs> uh, predicting intents and entities is a common way for machines to translate different human languages into machine understood input. At least for now, there are definitely challenges for these concepts, but that's for another time. Okay, so that wraps up the natural language understanding component called NLU. And now we're going to move on to dialogue management. The dialogue management component is sort of the brain. So NLU is the ear where you understand, you try to understand or like format what natural language is into something that the machine understands. Dialogue management is the brain that makes a decision on how the assistant should respond. And it makes a decision by looking at the current state of the conversation as well as the previous context. For example, like my name can also be a context, but you know there can be uh, many more um, other topics. So the component, it learns by kind of looking at the patterns from conversational data between the user and the assistant. And how does the component learn to keep the context? So a machine learning model under the hood observes what is the conversation currently about, right? And also like look at what is being said before. And that's dialogue management. All right, how are we doing there? Intent, entities, uh, you know, for NLU, and also we talked about um, dialogue management for a bit. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about the approach to building a production ready assistant and what is important there. And if we want to understand the approach to building a production-ready assistant, we need to talk about conversation-driven development. So if you've built a bot or a, an assistant before, you know that it's really difficult. Um, so building the production, uh, the prototype is not the difficult part, uh, but the problem is like when you need to build a prototype to something that you'd want to ship. And think about it, like especially for commercial use, you can't really like um, you need to uphold to a certain standard, right? So like the performance of the bot needs to be very consistent and that's why it's very challenging. And you need a mechanism that can allow your assistant to continue learn from real conversational data, not just the fake ones we create. I mean, if you look at the left, I have an example for you. So your user can be saying, I'm looking for a restaurant. And then your bot says, how about Chinese food? And then the user will be, will be like, uh, I had it yesterday. <laughs> and uh, to a bot, maybe that's like very ambiguous in the intent, but for a human, you know exactly what they mean, right? They mean that, well, they, they had it yesterday, but that means they don't want to have it again. And then the bot should prompt with, how about another type of food? In this case, Italian food. Um, so the recommendation is for you to share the assistant with the users early. Um, you should get feedback, annotate these real conversations with the intent and entities, like as you look at it. And that's the best um, training data for you, not the fake ones that you come up with, because sometimes you can't anticipate what your users are going to say. And then you iterate fast from there. Um, and the good news is, though, uh, when deploying a production-ready assistant, even though it's very difficult, uh, we can also think about all the good practices that we put in software development. Uh, and I can uh, share with you a few ideas, for example, version control, writing tests, building a CI, CD pipeline, uh, building an MVP and then iterating fast. I think we can also learn from that when we're developing conversational AI. So conversation-driven development is really the key to this. And when done right, it should help all of us build better conversational AI and also save the newcomers from having to learn this the hard way. 
And we're going to talk about the different steps, right, and how we can develop conversational AI. I think in our um, uh, demo later, maybe that can also resonate a bit. Um, so first is the sharing part, uh, which is the user always surprise you, as we see from the uh, Chinese food example there. So uh, get some test users to try the prototype as early as possible so you can already spot how uh, the users might talk beyond the happy path. Um, so, <laughs> for example, in the software, uh, if you uh, ship it without testing it, without uh, getting user input, your product isn't also also isn't going to be successful. And the same concept goes to conversational AI and building a bot. Next up, reviewing is an important step at every stage of the project. It's really worth reading uh, to see what your users are saying because they like you're basically doing user testing on them. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about the metrics right away. Uh, and conversations, like they're really your best friend. They're the most valuable data. And then in this step, annotation is what turns these um, conversation data into your training data, right? And by annotation, I mean labeling them with like intent entities. You can also teach the bot, uh, the brain, you know, the dialogue management on what are the responses or like action you want the bot to take. Uh, after the user says something, right? An action, it might not just be uh, a response. It can also be an API call. And this is where you can bring in some logic for your bot. Uh, probably we, didn't, we wouldn't have time to do that today with our demo, but um, yeah, <laughs> you, can, you can download the project and try it uh, next time. Testing. So we talked about uh, you know the production ready model. It would be good to have consistent behavior and not have too many regressions. So um, use the whole conversations that you have as end-to-end -end tests, right? So you can make sure when you whenever you update the model, it still stays. Um, it is still pass the test. It still can, uh, yeah, you know, like the previous conversations that worked would still be working, and you can run them on. Uh, a continuous integration server. Next is track. So uh, finally, we can think about some proxy measures to see which conversations are successful and which are not. Uh, for example, in call centers, negative signals could be useful too if users are not uh, doing the human handoff flow that we talked about, then that might be an indication of success. And finally, uh, study the in conversations that went smoothly and then fix the ones that failed. Uh, there are several ways to do it. You need to look deeper into it. Um, you know, for, for uh, the conversations that didn't go well, you can see, is it because the number of training data is too few for that particular intent? Or is it because uh, it takes a turn that you didn't anticipate? So once you take a look at the conversation, you can find a way to debug your conversations, just like how you would develop software. Okay, so that was a lot of context. Stay with me here. Um, it's <laughs> it's uh, really great to have you. So um, to summarize, bring you back together here, natural language understanding component NLU, it enables your assistant to understand what the user is saying, dialogue management, it predicts how the, user, uh, how the assistant should respond based on the specific state of conversation and also other details you have. And then conversation-driven development enable your assistant to continue learning from the real conversational data. So all of these kind of work together to empower you to build really good contextual assistants that can go beyond the level one and level two chatbots that we have seen. All right. The next part of the deep dive, and that's the last part before we jump into some live coding, we'll be talking about uh, how, like the pipelines that you would do for your training uh, and the natural language understanding models. So there are a few things I want to talk to you about so that um, you will be more prepared when you start building your bot. Uh, there are a few components in the usual pipeline. Uh, you might want to include a language model that's like loading some pre-trained models. Uh, if you want to use some pre-trained word factors in your pipeline, we'll go into that a bit more deeply uh, in a minute if you're not familiar with the concept. Uh, you have tokenizer, which is like uh, spitting the text into different tokens 
and you can like it's like back of words right you can break them down into like one word two words or you know in different language there are also different rules because in for example in like latin based languages uh, or uh, western languages like english then a very common one is breaking it with the white space tokenizer right but for chinese you you shouldn't do that <laughs> um and then you have featureizers, which are turning the text into uh, vectors. And then you have intent classifiers. So we talked about intents briefly. It assigns one of the intents to the user uh, incoming messages. And then you will have the entity extractor, which pulls out the entity, for example, person names like, you know, hello, I'm Yeni. You pull a Yeni as the name. And then, or some location, I'm from Hong Kong. You pull Hong Kong out as a location from the user message. And then you will have the selector, which is predicting a bot response from a set of candidate responses. For example, if you ask the bot, are you a bot? Then the bot respond with, uh, yeah, I'm a newsletter subscription bot. So it selects. And then maybe you can provide more, right? You can say, oh yeah, I'm a bot powered by Raza. So you can pick from several responses. So these are... Um, you know, like a high-level overview on what uh, the pipeline can consist of. And as I promised, I'm going to go a little bit into the language model because there are a lot of interesting things I want to talk to you about. Um, you can add these pre-trained language models to add the so-called like word embeddings into your pipeline. So you can configure your pipeline to use things like Spacey, Metier, NLP, or Hugging Face Transformers, you know, the very hyped uh, BED or GPT-2, et cetera, into the pipeline. Um, and then it loads the pre-trained language models, and then they can represent each word in a sentence as word embeddings. Let's talk about word embeddings because that's quite a mouthful. Uh, word embeddings, they are vector representations of words, which means each word in the message, they're converted into something like what you see on the screen on the left, right? Into a dense numeric vector. So these word vectors, they capture the semantic and syntactic aspect of the words, meaning that similar, okay, well, this is the real meaning. The real meaning is the similar words will be represented by similar vectors. So why do we do this? Why do we incorporate the language models? Um, it has several advantages. First, it boosts the performance of your models, even though you didn't put like too much training data, it already functions quite well. Uh, like your bot can already detect a lot of intents or maybe entities. And uh, if you have a small training data sample, then that will be very advantageous. But that's a very common situation, right? When you're first getting started with building your assistant. So that usually helps a lot. And in addition to that, since the training doesn't start uh, completely from scratch, then your the training of your NLU models will also go very fast. Uh, otherwise, if you put in, like, put in a lot of uh, training data, the, the training can take a long time. And if you use language models, it will be fast, and that gives you some fast iteration times there. Um, alternatively, if you don't use it, that's fine too, right? Like instead of using pre-trained word embeddings, uh, it can learn everything from scratch using the examples that you provide in the training data. And since your model, they're not using any pre-trained uh, knowledge, you definitely need much more training examples for your models to really learn and to start generalizing things that the, uh, the bot hasn't seen. Um, there are also like different reasons why you might want to do that. Uh, for example, if you want to use the bot in a very specific vertical, uh, for example, a legal vocabulary, uh, financial knowledge, or um, maybe like it needs to know plant, plant names very well, and that's not something that you can find in the pre-trained language corpus, then um, that might be something you want to do so that the performance would be better. And at the same time, I think that also struggles for uh, folks that uh, speak languages other than English and the other popular language. I think Chinese sometimes is also a bit difficult when the language models are not available in the language you want to train in, then you have no choice. 
All right, so uh, let's get to the part which is really fun, is the live coding. And today we'll be building an assistant together. Uh, feel free to follow along, but if not, I'll make the slides available so you know uh, what I talked about that, and I'll also make the uh, repository public. So what we're building today, to start small, we're gonna help users subscribe to a newsletter. And I'm gonna use one of the bots that are already available on uh, uh, the Raza Playground, which I'm gonna show you in a bit, and then we can uh, iterate from there. So the first task will be adding some NLU data to the subscription bot, and then we can train it and see how it works. All right. So this is the Raza Playground page. Basically, you can build your assistant and try things out without having to download the uh, Raza and without having to set it up basically and install Raza. So um, you can play around with that, but for me, I think it's just easier for me to just download it and I already have the code here and it, it runs. <laughs> so uh, let me actually clear everything. Okay. So the first thing we want to try is to add some uh, NLU data. But before we do that, let me just show you what the bot does, right? Okay, now it's loading uh, one of the models and that just comes directly from what you see here. There is a way for you to, yeah, you can also talk to the assistant here. But after you build the assistant, you tinker with some of the data you can actually go down and download project. And that's exactly what I did, right? And here we are. So let's wait for it to load and then we can talk to the assistant. So this assistant is a newsletter subscription bot, but the features are very basic because that's just what we're starting uh, on. And what we can do is to try out things that originally the bot doesn't recognize and then we can add the training data and then maybe finally the <laughs> the uh, assistant will understand what we're saying. Okay, so I say hello. Okay, how can I help you? I want to subscribe to your newsletter. What's your email address? It's my email address. Okay, great. What happens if I say bye? Okay, it doesn't understand bye. Um, all right, let's maybe make it a bit more difficult. I'm trying to find a way to break this so that maybe it doesn't recognize what I'm saying and then we can add the NLU data so that the bot will start understanding what we're saying. Okay, good evening to you. Let's see if it understands. Oh, did it understand me? Okay, well, it's way too smart. Okay, well, let's forget about this idea. Let's try to just add the buy because it totally didn't recognize it, right? Okay, let's do that. Uh, by the way, it's so smart because of the reason that I just mentioned you above. If you look at what we're loading here, we're adding spacey NLP. That means there are already some pre-trained model, right? So if you, if I, I'll show you the file. So here are all the training data that we have specified with us with the bot, right? And you know, as you as you see the like the good evening, it still picked up, and that's because we have the uh, some of the pre-trained language models already. So it understands a lot of the uh, expressions even without you having to provide a lot of training data example. But let's try to tackle the buy case because uh, it's not great that the assistant doesn't say buy to us, isn't it? Okay, so uh, we navigate to the nlu.yaml file. This is where we specify um, what the user might potentially say. All right, so let's go ahead and add an intent called buy. Like as the user, I want to say buy to the bot. And we can provide a few examples. 
I hope I'm creative enough. <laughs> uh, goodbye. Uh, what else can you say? Bye bye. Okay, I think that's good enough for now. Um, so yeah, this file is really to specify uh, a user's intent, what they might say to you, what you anticipate them saying. For example, subscribe, that's what I said to the bot when I want to subscribe to the newsletter. And then the uh, what I would say, like my email is, and that's informing the bot of my email address. And now we add an intent called buy. Okay, well, so if I say buy, the bot should say something back, right? And this is where you would uh, specify that in responses.yaml. And you already see some of the responses that we got, right? Uh, the bot told me, uh, hello, how can I help you? They asked me for my email, and then they tell me that I have finished subscribing. So I can just add, you can prepend it with other buy. So say bye. Uh, uh, Um, goodbye, human. We can also add a couple more to rotate. See you later. Okay. Uh, and then next up, we need to update them in a the domain file as well. Make sure all of the intents are in here. So I'll quickly do that. Slots, responses. Okay, copy this over. Okay, and then we also need to update the action, which is other by this one. Okay, now we're almost set, but there's actually one more thing. So now we have specified what the user might say, and then we have specified what the bot should reply with, and then we put everything together in the domain YAML. This is like really the centralized uh, brain putting everything together. We still have to tell the bot when they're supposed to say that. So like right now, this is how we teach the bot a sequence. So we use stories to do that. Uh, to greet and subscribe. So that's what you saw from the bot earlier. You know, when I, my intent is to greet the bot, the bot greets it back. Uh, when I wanted to say I subscribe, it gives me a newsletter form, uh, which means, and you, you have defined it here. You're asking for my email. And so once it got the email, then it knows that the uh, loop can stop. Uh, this is what the story is doing. Uh, but instead of writing the story myself, I'm actually going to use a better function, a uh, better, um, <laughs> uh, better feature in Raza open source, which is the Raza interactive, because when you have a form, it's a little bit easy to get it wrong. So we can do it here. Interactive. Mm -hmm. So what this Raza interactive does is it will actually go through the conversation line by line, and then you can specify to it if it's doing the right thing. And in this case, you can teach us how to say bye. So we can go through that together. It takes some time to load, uh, just like before. Yeah, as you can see, it's loading spacey again, which is such a great helper for us. <laughs> okay core model training completed. I think it's, it is almost done.
Okay. Now I can show you a bit better what I mean by that. So I say hi. The NLU model is classifying hi with intent greed, and there are no entities. So to recap, entities are things like like you know names or location. It is right. Well, I, all I wanted to do is to I'm sorry, is to say hi. So that is correct. And now, uh, so having having run greet, then the bot wants to run other greet, which is saying hi back, and that is correct. So it said hi back to me, and these also show you like the uh, probability that it's predicting, and because of the uh, training data that we have provided it, it just has very high confidence. So now it wants to run action listen, which means that it's waiting for further input from the user, which is correct. So now I'm gonna type in more things. I want to subscribe to this newsletter, to your newsletter. Okay, and the NLU model said that this is subscribing. There are no entities that is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now it wants to run the form because we need to fill in the email right for it to move forward. So that is correct as well. It wants to listen. See, this is what it's trying to tell you. It enters a loop. Uh, so it's in the form of like a newsletter form. And basically it doesn't get out of the loop unless you give it an email. That's what it means. Okay, then that will be nice. And I'll give them my email. Mm -hmm. And the intent is correct, right? Uh, so that this um, uh, inform, and then you have this uh, notation, which means that this is an email, which is an entity, and that is correct. Okay, um, having filled everything, the bot wants to run newsletter form again, and that is not correct. <laughs> so what? Um, oh, no, 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 I think, no, this is actually correct. Uh, wants to run other subscribed. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so what it's trying to do is actually just means that, okay, uh, we want to run this step and it says that requested slot equals null. That means we have filled all of the slots that's necessary and then we can move on and it will close the loop. And then we said that utter subscribed is correct because now it tells us that confirms that we have already subscribed. And now it continues to listen. Oh wait, continue. And then we, let's teach them how we can say bye. So let's say bye. Okay, it recognizes that this is the intent bye because we have already added it, right, remember? And there are no entities that is correct. Uh, and the bot wants to run action listen. So this is the one, this is actually the one that is incorrect because we want to say bye back. So let's teach it that it should say a reply. And then it is correct that it continues. Oh, okay, well, nice. It tells us goodbye, human. Now it wants to run action listen. And that's correct as well. So we have completed the training. Let's, that's the moment of truth to see if um, everything worked. Now let's do export and quit. It just saves everything in the right file. Uh, we can also double check. In NLU, you get like, another of these. Uh, so yeah, we said bye, right? So it added it as the training data. Uh, and then, yeah, in the domain, it also, no, the domain didn't change. But the stories, the story changed, uh, the story definitely changed, right? Like it added an interactive story here, uh, which says greet, the bot greets back, uh, I subscribe, and then they enter a form. And then, the slot was set and then it exits the loop. And then when we say bye, it says bye back. So now let's give it a try to see if it all works perfectly. Uh, fingers crossed, moment of truth.
Okay, so we say hi. Uh, we say I want to subscribe. Email address. Oh no, it didn't work. Why did it not work? Okay, let's make sure this is actually trained. So what I'm doing is I'm retraining a model to make sure that we actually have, uh, we are loading the new model with the new information in it. Because if it's not, then it's not gonna do it. All right, core model training completed. Model is saved. Let's try again. And this time, yeah, you see there's a different number here. So we're using the new model. to subscribe to the newsletter what is my email address as always oof now it worked so it showed that before when we didn't train the model it didn't work and then after we train the model then it works all right let's just quickly do another one to um to show that uh that the bot will understand when people challenges them so Let's say if I want the bot to answer uh, a bot challenge question, for example, are you a bot? Uh, wait, this should be bot challenge. And then we give examples. Are you a bot? Are you human? And we'll also make sure that it understands. And what should the bot respond when getting challenged? Better bot challenge. Uh, I am a newsletter subscription. Bots powered by browser art. Okay, and then we need to make sure that these are reflected in the domain .yaml. Challenge responses. There we go. Okay, and we have a new action which is under bot challenge. Okay, now we're set. Mm, since we already have this format, I'm just gonna cheat a bit and add it at the end. If you want to challenge the bot, um, here. Bot challenge. Okay, then this time 
we will remember to retrain our, our uh, model. So here I can explain a bit more. Uh, I want to add another intent so that the bot can understand when a human is challenging it if it's a bot. <laughs> and as a bot, ethically, we should always respond by the truth that we're a bot powered by uh, Raza or um, just that I'm not human. And then we're just adding the intents in the domain file, which is really the brain and the centralized place where all the information is. We also add the responses here as well as an action so that it's registered in here. And then with the story, I'm just making sure that uh, this is represented in the flow. And then we can give it a try again. And then hopefully this is all gonna all come together and it's gonna work on the first trial. And in this case today, we will have added two new use cases to this simple bot of a newsletter uh, subscription bot, right? First is the bot knows how to say hi. And then second of all is the bot would know how to respond when a human challenges if it's a bot. But definitely there are many more things you can do with Raza, not just answering uh, are you a bot questions. You can hook it up with an API. You can have custom actions where uh, you do things that uh, is specifically uh, by your use case. Okay, let's try to talk with the bot. So yeah, there are many more things. Well, while we're here, maybe I can also show you how the form look like. So you know uh, how it enters a loop, right? And it wants the email from me uh, to, to move forward. So this is how you can specify the newsletter and what you need from it. So in this case, you need an email so that it will break away from the loop. And that's useful because um, sometimes um, you prompt the user for some uh, information and you just want the, these few things before you move on to the conversation. And it could be very helpful. Okay. So we're already very familiar with the flow here and I'm going to challenge it. Okay, so it understood what I'm saying and I hope it handles the buy. So everything is perfect. So I think our talk should end here on a good note. Yep, so to recap, Today we discussed the world of conversational AI, what are the main use cases there, the five levels of conversational AI, what's the status quo, what's the limit and a framework to explain where we're at. And then we did a crash course on all the important concepts that we'll need for NLP and conversational AI, which uh, powered us through building an assistant. So we did two things today. One is adding the buy use case and the other is bot challenge, but you can do many, many things uh, more with the infrastructure that uh, we provide. So that is all. I hope you will get in touch. Uh, feel free to uh, tweet me at Yanni Cheng. Uh, I'll also respond to your DMs as well. If you also want to get in touch, like you can also email me. Uh, today, it's really nice to, um, to spend time with you uh, with a keynote and hope you have a little bit of takeaway from the talk. Yeah, then until then, thank you. And I'll take your questions from here. Uh, hello, now is our Q&A session. So the first question is, did the project need a lot of sampling data to chain? If yes, how or where did you collect this data? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I think in that talk, I, sh I briefly showed a slide. Uh, actually, for the demo project that we worked on, there are only a few, maybe less than 10 training data per intent. And the reason why the bot already understands quite a lot of the intents and entity is because I use Spacey as a pre-trained language model. So in this case, then, um, like, yeah, we're basically cheating there and getting some help. So in this case, even with a small, um, uh, sample size, you can, uh, the bot already understands a lot. Um, as to the question on how do you collect the data, if you like train everything from scratch, it will be slightly more complicated. 
And as we mentioned a little bit in the uh, in the presentation, uh, then for example, if you train in a language that doesn't have these pre-trained language models, or if you're working in sectors or verticals like financial data, legal, or you want to talk about plans, for example, then you might have to do something from scratch. In this case, I would recommend you share the bot early with some of the users that uh, you anticipate they'll use the bot. And then you collect what kind of things they want to ask there. And then so that you can really share the bot early and then collect these data, like real conversational data, which after you annotate them with intent and entities, you can turn them into your training data. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, AI is usually a black box. If we use AI for conversational thoughts in the banking industry and some misunderstanding happens, how do we clarify the responsibility? That's a really good question. And I think, uh, I think, I think this is a really, really good question to ask. So, um, a lot of people like look at conversational AI and then they look at like things like GPT-3, right? Because it's so smart. It can like blurt out a lot of conversation. Even, you can even talk like a human, but that's the problem with, um, you know, these models that kind of generate things itself because you can't really guarantee what it's being said. And that's why uh, when you use uh, these, uh, bots in production, you probably don't want to just feed things like GPT-3 into the response, right? For example, in the uh, bot that we have developed together, uh, actually nothing is like really generated by the bot, right? Like for all the responses, we provide the response. So all the bot would respond uh, with is the set of responses that we have already written for it. Um, and that's why that, you know, since the bot doesn't really make up data, it only says the things that we have taught it to say, and that minimizes the risk of it saying something wrong or, you know, uh, revealing uh, unneeded information. So that's how you can uh, prevent the risk there. And another advantage of using frameworks that are, for example, on-premise, like Raza is on-premise, is also that uh, it has the security uh, reason to it so that uh, it doesn't leak the data. So that might be another thing to consider when you work for an industry that cares a lot about security. Uh, yeah, the next question is, what's the difference between dialogue flow and the Raza? Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> So I think dialogue flow, it's like another solution that provides like customer success or, uh, you know, for a bot use case. Um, so I think the most important difference is they're not on premise, right? So they're a hosted solution. So a lot of the data actually goes to dialogue flow itself. For Raza, it's an on premise solution. So all the data you get to keep, or maybe you can also uh, host it on your cloud uh, if you use this solution. Another difference is that Rasa is open source and Dialogflow is uh, pretty much uh, closed source. For Rasa in general, the development is a little bit low, more low level. So definitely you need to involve developers in the workflow to get everything set up. And uh, I think for Dialogflow, maybe um, you, it can target a little bit more on the business side of things. But I think uh, it really depends on the package as well, because for Raza open source, for example, that's definitely command line interface. But there is also a Raza enterprise product, which works more, more or less like Dialogflow. But I hope you I hope that answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Yenny. And the last one is um, how to properly test the bot to make sure the bot understands the user's intent expressed in different ways. Uh huh. Yeah. So I, I think that's great because it's a. Uh, borrowing some of the software concepts into how we build conversational AI as well. So when we talk about conversation-driven development, then one step is testing. So what you can do is you can write some test files that specify, uh, for example, like uh, how a user would say something that, and then you can classify that as an intent. So whenever you train a new model, you can just uh, run tests like Raza test and then it runs all the test files that you have specified to make sure that, uh, you know, if the user says this thing, uh, it is still classified as this intent and the bot still respond with a certain response that you want to respond with, if that makes sense. So yeah, like there is a way to write test files to uh, test that the bot can do certain use cases. Okay, thank you very much.